All right, it is Tuesday morning and the 2nd of April, brand new month and a new week of uh, discussions around democracy 101. This is where we come to grips with uh, who the, the the major influences are on our democracy, what we need to know, yep. what we need to pay attention to. We've spent a lot of time focused on the elections themselves, but we're also looking at the people involved in politics, the people who have a message to share, the people who are making a contribution yeah. to our democracy. In some and shape think, or form, yeah. I think our guest here this morning is uh, definitely an example of that. His name is Mpo Dagad, and he's written uh, an interesting book called I Am the Vision, something which uh, Jack has spent some time reading. Did you do your homework? Yes, I did. Very yes, good. I did. Very good. Well, he's with us this morning. How's it, Mpo? How are you? I'm well, thank you. It's How nice to see you. Yeah, let me yeah, turn on your mic good. there. There we go. There we are. Very good. Perfect. Good morning, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Very good. So the first thing I want to clear up is you are not Rise Mzanzi. You are Arise South Africa. Yes. Different I... story, a similar name. Uh, are, does that upset you? Is this like um, Quanto is Cizwe in the ANC, uh, <laughs> MK party, does the MK belong to the ANC or not? Arise <laughs> South Africa, Rise Mzanzi. <laughs> Yeah, look, we registered first with, with the IEC and, and when they registered after us, we tried to object it, um, emphasizing the fact that this would confuse voters. The IEC felt that they start with an R, we start with an A. They felt that we we're in two different places in the ballot paper, so they allowed it to happen. But if we did have our way, we would have wanted them not to use Oh, you must take up uh, that issue with Songs yes. or Zibia and company. Huh? <laughs> but I, I, I think it goes to show just how much uh, trouble we are in as a country. If multiple politicians are thinking of coming up with a name that has to do with rising, we yeah. are clearly at the We're bottom clearly, of the we've food fallen chain. We have if fallen. If we need to rise. Oh, that's yeah. true. That's do you think so? Is that, is that fair? Look, I think majority of our people still live in poverty. Um, and I think it's been 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a recent study that was done that I found quite interesting. It basically said that South Africa, well, it was looking at who are the richest countries in the world. And they did a whole lot of different countries, looked at mineral resources, the youth in the country, the potential of the country. It was a whole array of different things. Right. And they couldn't come up with who's number one. It was very difficult for them to do so. But they said, we've got the top three that we're all arguing about. And they said, this is the top three. I said, one, Russia. Well, not one. One of them is Russia. Congo and South Africa. Mm. So we live in a country that is the richest country in the world or part of the top three, if you want to put it that way. Is this just in terms of what mineral resources? So this is in terms, it was, it was a more vast study. They looked at mineral resources. They looked at the water. They looked at the climate. They looked at sustainability. They looked at the farmland. They looked at a whole lot of different things. The mm. one thing they didn't look at, which is brilliant, was the politicians. Oh my God. Which yeah. I think that's, otherwise that's, we would have come up the Otherwise bottom. we would have. <laughs> I don't we think we would have made the cut. <laughs> so, nope. So they looked at what we have, yeah. Before we get into any of that, I do want to remind people of, of we did, I've in, interviewed you once before. We spoke long ago. You are not only the acclaimed author of this uh, book, Mr. Bitcoin, How I Became a Millionaire at 21, which you did, um, but you also are a keynote speaker, debater, engaging talk show host, and now you're going into politics. So we're yes. going to talk about that. But as an entrepreneur and a businessman with many years of experience, why the hell would you go into politics? I asked this of Herman Mashaba years ago when he first announced that he was going to go into mm. politics. And he said, like, you, you can't operate on an island. You, you can't exist in a vacuum. You have to rise up with the society around you. In other words, you can't think that you can trample on all the other people's misery and still make it. Is that kind of what you also were motivated by or is there something else going on? Look, I think for me, the journey was different. So I became quite successful in my field, blockchain technology. And in 2018, Sir Ramaphosa asked me to join his advisory committee on the fourth industrial revolution. So I became a commission of the fourth industrial revolution in the office of the president. So mm -hmm. I got to sit with them, understand what's going on, understand the problems at depth, and I think when you get into such a position, I, I'm a young person, so I'm still very, my outlook on life is still very naive to say we want to do change. So by the way, when right. the president hmm. asks you to be an advisor like this, do they pay you? So we were paid, um, but yeah, it's not what people think it is, but yes, we were paid. It's yeah. funny yeah. That, that you had to add that caveat. But it's fine. Anyway, let's go on. <laughs> Look, I, think if, if I, I can mention the amounts we were paid if people, if we want no, to know. No, no, no. Sorry. Okay, cool. Sorry. So, so in that process of you sitting down and advising a president on what to do, 
you get invested, right? Because you're sitting down with mm. documents that the general public doesn't see mm. of all the issues in the country, what people are going through, what they're experiencing, and you get invested in, I want to solve this problem. And I think the entrepreneur in, in me is a problem solver to say, how do we yeah. solve the problem? How do we fix this? You mm. know? And I worked so hard in ensuring that we come up with solutions that would fix the country only to hand those solutions over to ministers and politicians. And they're like, oh, well, well, this is nice, but thank you. Yeah, we, but thanks, but no thanks, you know. Sort of um, vibe, yeah. And Paul, this fourth industrial revolution, I see someone uh, slippery pickle in the comments, fourth industrial revolu revolution throwing up. Um, is is that, have we not gone beyond that already? Because I mean, it's become some, like somewhat start, of a buzzword. Yeah, they started talking about this. I will never forget that terrible minister of communications, Faith, uh, what was her name? She was she was in charge of the SABC among other things yes. at the time. She she was yeah. the minister of telecommunications yeah, or something she, like and that. And she was talking about like we've got to digitize this, and I mean they're still not digitized at the SABC. But True. Mm. She would throw around fourth industrial revolution like she'd come upon some very important and and and, and it's like a moment of enlightenment. Yeah, like I this is where it's going, and look, this proves that I'm not an idiot. Yeah, and I think. You know, when, when politicians come up with a buzzword like this, and fourth industrial revolution was a buzzword, and you're a guy who's built blockchain technology, you actually understand this stuff. Were you able to make any headway at all? Because these guys, they, play, they pay lip service to it. They, they catch a, a catchphrase, mm -hmm. and then they beat it to death. But they don't ever really ask, did anyone, was he, anyone even curious, like, what is blockchain technology? Did you get any government... And I'm not trying to just, you know, knock the government because I do believe that there are probably some good people who are trying very hard to make things better. I just, we don't know who they are at director general level or whatever. Any of them ever ask you questions, genuine curious questions about like, how does this work? What is Bitcoin? How does uh, the, the, the blockchain technology that you're an expert in afford us an opportunity to create jobs do things differently. Did they ask you questions? So they didn't. And I think what <laughs> what what I sort of learned through through my experience of being there is that things are not the way that they seem. So so when I got into the advisory, I said to the guys, and a lot of us agreed to say the first thing we must do in our country is zero rate internet, right? Because if you look at any mm -hmm. nation like South Africa, we have a vast population of people, and people are very ill informed. We've got yeah. uneducated, we've got people that are getting the wrong education, and we've also got people that are getting education, but in a limited sort of way. Mm. So we wanted to zero rate the internet. But the big problem became when on that advisory committee, the CEO of Vodacom and the CEO of MTN were also present. And we were all saying, well, look, let's re zero rate internet so that, you know, we can begin to talk about the fourth industrial revolution. And these CEOs are saying, what about our profits? These CEOs are saying, what about what we're doing? You know, and you sort of find out that, you know, politicians have shares and this one has shares. And really the country is not able to move forward because these corporates put their shares before the citizens. Mm. And you see it because we can't discuss any form of technology without internet. We, it's a, it's a non-starter. Right. So, so what I found was that a lot of times politicians use the right words that could be solutions, mm. but those solutions don't get off the ground because I think in, in, in their world, they want to say the speech and not implement. Now, given, given what you just said, um, you're a politician now. Why should anyone believe what you have to say? Because, I mean, it, it could be lip service, just like every other politician that we've heard before. Uh, you're certainly not the first politician to put out a book. Uh, you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's a lot of things that we have heard in the past 30 years that have made a lot of South African voters, you know, not take politicians seriously. Why should we take you seriously? I think that's a question that I've, I've, I've also looked into. And I think that's why I titled the book, I Am the Vision. Okay. Right? Because in that statement, I'm trying to say to people that we need to stop waiting for politicians to save us. Each and every one of us in South Africa are the vision of what the country should be. And I think the first thing that I would do in getting into government is making sure that we take power away from politicians. Mm. In South Africa, politicians have too much power. If you look at this country, over 50% of the money that's in circulation comes from government. Mm. So if you're yeah. getting somebody who's spending 50%, and by the way, this is your money because you're the taxpayer, right? If somebody's spending 50% of your money, mm -hmm. of VAT, you're paying 15%. If you're out in the up enchilantes of being paid, you're paying 30-something percent. You also pay your rates and taxes, your water levies, et cetera, et cetera. Look, majority of your money is going to these people. 
And as a result of that, you should be expecting more from these people and we should hold yeah. them more accountable. Mm -hmm. So one of my things is to say that we need to destabilize the power that government has. We need to put back the power into institution because we live in a country where these ministers have too much power. And, and, and it's a conversation that a lot of people would never really say because they go into government to say, well, we want to use this power to do this and the other. But the truth is the entrepreneurs are the people that really cause changes in our nation. Mm. So a lot of what I stand for, what Arise South Africa stands for is to say, let's actually empower the institutions that be and destabilize the politicians. Let's so, defund them. So what would you do if you got enough votes to have a seat? And what would you do if you get enough votes to be president? Let's imagine a hypothetical scenario. It's highly unlikely, but let's just put that aside for a second. Let's imagine the people of South Africa went, oh, hell yeah, I will go with this guy. And we'll do it because these are his policies. So what are those policies? So I think the, what would you do? the first thing is to ensure that we empower entrepreneurs. There's a big myth around here that jobs are created by politicians. And jobs really aren't. Jobs are made by entrepreneurs. So mm -hmm. the first thing we'd do is empower the small business. Find entrepreneurs that have employed three, four people, go in there and say, and we're not finding entrepreneurs that are just sitting down saying, I've got a business plan. Mm. We're finding people that have already got three and four people employed and say, look, how do we make sure you employ 10 people? And they let us know to say, right, for me to employ 10 people, I need this, that, and the other. Now people would say, but there's already a department of small business doing that. I've looked into the department of small businesses. Mm. Majority of the businesses they fund fail. The reason that happens is because their funding mechanisms are not based on people that have started something, but they're just based on people that are applying based on an idea. And any entrepreneur knows that the first business, you will fall flat, mm. even the second one and the third one. So it's about plugging into ecosystems that are already working and growing those ecosystems to create jobs. So that's the first thing. How do we find somebody who's employing three, four people and say, listen, we want you to employ 20 people. What do we do? How do we do that successfully? The second thing, is going after the land. Now, this is a controversial matter that a lot of people say, mm. but I, I, I find that that's one of the things we have to do. What do I mean by going after the land? If you own land in this country, you're privileged, right? And if you've got a privilege, privilege must come with responsibility. What if we had to say, and I'm, I'm talking hypothetical here, that if you own 100 hectares of land, for every 100 hectares of land that you own, you must produce one job, right? And let's say the landowners say, well, we own the land. Why are we going to listen to you, et cetera, et cetera. Then we say, look, if your land is not producing jobs in our nation, then we're going to need to take it back and give it to people who will use it to produce land. I'm sorry, to produce jobs and grow the economy, right? Mm. And come up with a concept that Australia has implemented beautifully to say that let the land produce jobs for the people that live in it. And those that have land and they are not doing anything with that land. Let's take that land and give it to other people that but will it's actually not, do okay, something. So, so then you don't that, believe in property rights. That, that is difficult. Oh, yeah, it's no, because, I mean, yeah. that. Let's get straight to it. Because if you, if you don't believe in property rights, like you, you as the government have the right to take land away if you think someone isn't using it properly. Look, I think, I think my, my issue with the property rights you're referring to would have to go back to history to say, how do we define who owns what land? Well, I own hmm. this phone. If you don't think I'm using it properly and you believe in your policies that you could take it away hold from on. you, you don't believe phone. in property. You bought the phone. Right? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. What if you bought the land? No, Most people in this country have, a, have a proof of their land ownership. They've got a title. Deed. Okay. They might have a title, deed, but we need to look at how did they acquire the land, right? So this land now, Most people who are alive now bought it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're then talking about majority, uh, sorry, a minority of the land, right? And that's not the land we're talking about. No, the majority of the land in this country is owned by the government. Yes, so, it is. So who are we dispos... Uh, you see, nothing is for nothing. You understand this as a business. Of course. Yeah, you know, nothing comes out of a vacuum. Yep. So there is already an existing structure. Now we may want to disrupt that structure, but if your solution is property rights don't exist, then there is no economy. Okay. And because so, 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 I, can, so, I can take your Bitcoin. Yeah, because, okay. and, and the headache I have when it comes to the land question, specifically when it comes to history, is how far do we go back? Cool. I, I love that you guys are saying this because I think we, we can't look at it from a vacuum, right? Mm. Australia and New Zealand say to the whole world, you come to Australia and New Zealand, we'll give you land that people are not using to be able to farm, right? Sure. And they say, as long as you're producing jobs for our people, we'll give you the land, right? Where do they get this land from? One, they take it from people that are not using it as a country, right? Two, take it. 
Hmm. Well, if you're saying, uh, as far I mean, as I know, they do have property rights there. I mean, look, look, I, I, th I think the semantics of property rights, because I think you're, you're based on semantics. This is hugely important because it people is. won't work if you if you if they're not going to own what the fruits of their labor. No, but but I think why would they, and why would you hire people? You talk about job creation. Yes. Why would you hire people if you don't have something for them to do? The purpose of job creation is not to create jobs. It is for those people who have jobs and those people for whom jobs might be created to have things that they can do, that they perform a valuable service in the economy. For. Cool. Just giving people a salary is not doing anything for the economy. Look, so, so in countries where they did implement this, right, what they began to see is that they began to see farmers move from Zimbabwe or automatically go to Australia, South Africa go to Australia, because they said, when we get to Australia, the government gives us land. Right now, you might ask the questions right now to say this sounds impractical, sounds like it won't work, sounds like it's property rights. But what you will quickly find is that there's a lot of people that own land in this country that one, they are not using the land. Two, they don't plan who, on using the who land. Who are these people who are not using the land? I mean, land? If, you, if you look at the, the, the land statistics, it shows you that we've got so much arable land that's not being used. Millions of hectares that's not being used. People that have owned this land ever since their grand grand grandfather owned the land. Yeah. Sure, I, mean, I, I don't think that's look, look, true. I mean, it's true. Look, if you, if you own land say, and you're not using it, I, I, I wonder who those people are that are so wealthy oh, but, that they yeah, don't but Garrett, you, you can't tell me that you've, you've I mean, walked, you've, I mean, you've traveled South Africa. You can't tell me that the land that you see I that see, is arable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I hold see on. vast farms. I yeah, see, there's, I see there's, forests. There's, there's I see a, people who are engaged in the economy already. It's not like they're not using the land. There's multiple ways that that you know, land is used across the country. My question is, it, it speaks specifically to the property rights that Gareth's talking about. Saying that you're just going to take the land and give it to people that are going to use it sounds uh, a bit more abrasive than saying we will incentivize people who are not using their land. Well, it's straight up perhaps... it's straight up state confiscation. Yeah, because <laughs> that's, what, that's what it's like. like you know? Land expropriation without compensation. That, on the face of it, is a bad idea. Look, I, I think... The, the issue that I'm having with at you this guys point, is, you're the last person I'm going to vote for. Even Julius is more reasonable. Look, I, I mean, I love, I love the the, the 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 robust debates, and I'd love to hear what other people's perspectives are. But maybe let me bring it to this point, right? What is your definition of who owns the land? Because well, there are people in this country that are saying we don't need definite. I have a title deed for the property I live yeah, in. But how did you get the your moment. title? Deed? I paid for the property. Who did you pay? I paid the bank. Gave me the no, money. There, there, there are people who got the, the, the that have owned me. the land for many years that never got it from the bank. That who? came a lot of people. There's a lot of trusts in this country that own farms that bake back way I, back before. I, if apartheid. they have, if they have documentary evidence to prove that they have a claim to the land, then that gives them a better claim than someone who's making it up or someone who says that they don't own anything. True, whatsoever. and that's the land we're dealing with. We're not dealing with land that you bought or you're living in to say, oh, we're just going to come and grab your land. We're dealing but with. But how, how can I land. trust you with that? Because hmm. it's taken you this long to get to the explanation. How could I trust you with anything? What if you're going to come and take my TV because you think I'm not using my TV properly? Right. That's not a sensible economic policy. <laughs> Look, I this think it's like what was, did you make this up with your friends at a drunken bry one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, I, th I think you need to look at how Australia and New Zealand is doing it and look at how it's affected uh, Australia and New Zealand are completely different kettle of fish to us. They don't look, have our history. They don't have our, 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 our struggles and difficulties. They also have competent governments Mm. which I don't necessarily agree with. There's nothing about the Australian government I'm jealous of. Yeah, they, I mean, they're, they're, of late but, they've been weird. But they do have competence. And also, I think we have a different sort of constitution here. Okay. Maybe, maybe let me put it to, to, to you, because I think a lot of times when we comment on land, we speak from a place of privilege, right? The three of us here, we're in Santon, right? We're mm. sitting in privilege, right? Let's no, I, I'm still paying for my house. Cool. I don't know what you mean. I know what you mean, but you're not in the shack. No one gave me, no, but no one gave me anything. But the majority of the people so in this country. No one gave you anything. Shack. You became a millionaire because you were working you hard worked at it. and you invested carefully and you built technology. So, so I don't understand why you feel like you have to take on guilt for the people who didn't. No, but I think this. Otherwise, is the, just give away your money. Stop talking shit and just give away your money. But this is the disconnect that people have. That a lot of people think that way to say, "Oh, everybody who's living in a shack is lazy." No, they're no, not. No, 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 nobody no, no, said no, that. No, but, yeah. but if you feel guilty about being Rich. It's not about the guilt. It's not well, about the don't, guilt. Don't assume. I, I'm not going to say I'm privileged. 
okay, maybe let's not get into the privileged conversation, but you be- got you started it. Okay, cool. But believe me, you, <laughs> where we're sitting right now, we, we're part of the privileged in South Africa because majority of the people live in poverty. Now, I want to put it to you to say, how do you employ majority of these people that live in poverty that have tried to what get jobs? What are you jobs? employing them for? Okay. We're employing them to use the land to create produce. This is farmable land that can be used. What if they don't farm- want to farm land? They don't want to be laborers. You think they want to chill in the, in the shack all day? I don't think they want to chill in the shack all day, but a lot of people want to be entrepreneurs like you. Yeah, that's fine. They, they, but what I'm saying is entrepreneurship begins from somewhere. It might start so by... You're going to make them go and work the farms like slaves first. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's what it sounds like. I mean, it's just a salary, but otherwise no, 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 no. it's like, it's, it's you guys are sitting in the chef. <laughs> get on your... Yeah, I'm giving you a hard time, but you deserve it. Yeah, no, no, I love it because I yeah. think get up the off your get up off, You're the one who's saying get up off your backside. You're not allowed to stay in the shack all day, and we're going to put you to forced labor on the farm. No, so 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 I'm not the one who's saying that. They are saying the farms, by the way, that we've taken away from people from who people. already own them. It might have been working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, they are saying the people are saying to us, look, in South Africa, it's difficult for us to do anything because, firstly, the shack we live in, we don't even own the land on it. Already we're starting on the back foot. Right? Okay. So That's a lot true. of them are saying, we're not ever going to have the dignity. When somebody says, we've stolen something, or we've done this, or we've done that, they said, we don't feel that we, we are part of South Africa. And that's the reason why so when we vote. why don't you start with getting people title deeds to the property they already have? Of course, yes, definitely. That's yeah. something that we're definitely going to do. I agree. To say, let's, but to your point, the title deed we're giving them is somebody's land that you're saying, right? Because they didn't have any land. Right. They set up, they, they, they shacks there, and they're living there. And by us giving them the title, Oh, we're taking the land away from somebody. But I, I, I want to bring this point to all of you, right? To say, mm. if you've got over 1.6 million households in South Africa that are living in shacks, right? And you believe that they are living in shacks because they have not tried their best no, to no, get out nobody of Nobody here. No, but that. I'm not saying you guys. I'm yeah, talking okay. about the general public, right? right? And you believe that they are living in shacks because they've not tried their best. They have not applied themselves. They're not. I think that you're speaking from a point of not understanding it. I've sure. been to these places and I've sat down with them to say, what are you going to vote for? What do you want? And they said, when we hear somebody say they'll give us an RDP, we want to vote because for the first time in our lives, we'll have ownership of something that means dignity to us, right? Mm. Now, it might upset the few people that say, well, whose money are you going to use, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the minority, the privileged minority. Well, let's not use privilege so that we don't get into that word, but the, the well, fortunate. The haves the, haves, the have not. Yeah, the, right. The haves, well, let's right? just remember sure. also that the haves are paying the taxes, the majority of the taxes yeah. in this country that are paying to keep the <laughs> wheels turning. And, and so, come to think of it, uh, I remember Roman mentioned this, that uh, 20% of what Cyrus collects is from income tax and the rest is just compliance. So... There's ineptitude in SARS. There's, there's, oh, there's holes but, everywhere. Now, I think what I want to get into, right? Uh, you're saying that, you know, someone who looks at people who are living in shacks and uh, in, in, in abject poverty are just sitting there because uh, some people might think that they're just lazy and all of this stuff, right? We know that to not be the truth. Okay. Now, my question goes to entry-level jobs. Okay. Your your ideas about you know making farms and all of this stuff, or yeah, even sure. the fourth industrial revolution and, and, and like, blockchain, and you're not going to be able to pull some guy out of the shack and immediately no, teach him how to be. You're a definitely not going engineer. to do that. So Look. I think if 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 anything, the jobs that should be uh, pushed are those where you've got people working in buildings such as these. You give them skills that are transferable from one place to another. We need we need electricians. We need plumbers. Yes. We need people that can lay pipes. We Definitely. need all of those things. Now, telling us about farms and whatnot, I'm not sold on it. Let's talk about some of these, I don't want to say basic, but entry-level jobs. Okay, cool. So, so, so maybe let me bring it back to the way I started the, the conversation is to say that we are the richest country in the world, or top three, if exactly. you want to put it that way, right? The narrative that Africans must always work entry-level jobs must change, first and foremost, right? Okay, That's not please, the goal, right? Paul, I'm going to have to stop you there because it's this sounds like um, platitudes. Okay, so this narrative changing thing. Let's just be realistic for a second. Okay. The reason that so many people are sitting at home in shacks is not because they're lazy. Mm-hmm. It is because there is not enough going on in the economy for them to be meaningfully or gainfully employed. employed yeah. Or because they don't have any skills that the economy can use. 
Okay, so so I do you I, agree with that? No, no. Okay, can I speak? Right, no. I, I I just also want to speak here. Right, sure. You've got mines in this country that for years have exported the minerals on a daily basis, right? We have more trucks leaving with minerals in our country than any other country known in this earth, right? Platinum, vanadium, gold, silver, yeah. diamonds, right? Mm. Those produce or those minerals could be processed in our country, right? They are not. The reason why they are not processed in our country, number one, is because of issues like politician competence, whether the, the, the labor force will be able to participate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Number two, in Limpopo, you've got avocados, mangoes, lychees, uh, all leaving over, right? They're going to Dubai, they create serums, they come back, people buy them as lotions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You've got wood leaving from Sanin, it goes to China, it becomes toothpicks, it comes back, it's sold to our people, right? But you don't think anything here has to do with skills? Like, do we have the skills to do those things? So, at the cost that they do in Indonesia. Cool. So with the tech that's available now, skills is no longer the conversation it used to be, right? I'll give you an example, 3D printing. You're able to put raw materials in 3D printing and immediately you have finished goods. So the skills conversation would have been relevant 10 years ago. But who, in, in today's day and age, where there is technology available for us to do these things, it's about the will of the government in order to implement that. Yeah, but you're not going to just put any random person in front of a 3D printer. Like it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a walk in the park. Yeah. No, 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 but I mean, I never said it would be random. But what I'm saying is that don't subject us to okay. artisans but and be, plumbers be, and this realistic. and that. We will no, do that. Be realistic. And also, we must go for the 3D printer. Our education system is a dis disaster, right? So we're not producing skilled people. Yes. Uh, you acknowledge that. Definitely. Yeah. Right. So how are you going to get someone to operate the 3D printer, which they can't afford because they're already unemployed? Mm. Okay. They now need to learn the skills to operate the 3D printer. Technology can only go so far if you don't have the skills to make sense of the technology, just as you learned from Bitcoin. I mean, I remember our conversation about blockchain. Yes. And you yeah. know what you're talking about there, but most people in this country have no grasp on the idea of blockchain. Most people in this country are so poorly educated because of this government that they are not useful in the economy. I said it before, it's not that they're unemployed, it's that they're unemployable. So mm. how do we fix that? Right, so, so allow me to go through a case. And by the way, I know it's unfair to load all these problems onto yeah. you. We're talking no, about the economy. Of course, yeah. yeah. We, we may I'm, stumble upon he's running a solution. For president, it's right. fair. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, I love it because the more frank we are with politicians, the better. Yes. You know, I hope you, you do this with all politicians. Yes, we Can't do. be asking me what my favorite breakfast is. No. <laughs> now, when we look at India and we realize what India's done, right? Yeah. What happened in India is they went to remote villages and they said, give these people the internet, right? Oh. They dropped off devices and they dropped off the internet in India, in remote villages, right? When they came back after five years, they found that 96% of the youth in that village understood how to program, right? Mm -hmm. They went in and they asked these kids, who taught you how to program? They were all like, we went on YouTube. We heard that Mark Zuckerberg became a billionaire through creating Facebook. He learned how to program. We're now programmers, right? They also found that 15% of the kids there were now able to program a program like Uber, Right, which many people would say, oh, Uber's quite difficult. Uber's, you need to learn, you need to learn for Uber. And they came back and said, Young kids in India, who taught you how to program an Uber program? They were like, Listen, we looked at the price of Uber, we saw everybody becoming rich, and all of us programmed Uber. Right mm. now, you come back and you ask yourself, Who taught these people? Where was the university? Where's the lecturer? Who taught them how to program? All they did is they gave them internet and gave them devices. And here in South Africa, we've had, history. we've had the internet, we have two phones for every person. It, that means uh, almost that conversation every, for me is so tricky because the internet is so expensive in this country. Okay, fair enough. But sure. but people yeah. people prioritize it to the point where even if you haven't got money for food, you have money for airtime or for data. We know that. We know people prioritize it. Hmm? Look, at, at, so at, at, why are they, what are they doing with their data? Going on TikTok and learning a dance. India in India, huge population of people, massive massive competition to get ahead because poverty there is. Way, way worse than it is here. Yes. Mm -hmm. like absolute poverty. You haven't seen that until you've been in India. I'm sure you agree. So where are the, are, are you just going to like throw the internet? And listen, I'm all, I'm with you, 100% with you. We should zero rate the internet. Mm. Of course, that still means someone somewhere has to pay for it, which right. means probably the taxpayer, because that's always the guy who has <laughs> That's mm. fine. You pay tax, Jack mm -hmm. pays tax, I pay tax. And mm. we understand 
part of that is making society better. Right. So I would rather see it going to zero rating the internet than going into like parastatals that are going to waste our money. Right? Mm-hmm. So I'm with you. But are you convinced of the fact that we will produce skilled labor? And even if people teach themselves with YouTube videos and they become entrepreneurs, that doesn't need government. So you're almost talking yourself out of a job if you're president and you talk like that. No, because I mean, the evidence doesn't point to South Africans using the internet to do, to do useful things with it. Yeah. Like we've got the youth unemployment in Gauteng. Let's, okay. let's talk specifically about Gauteng. Um, you, if, if Gauteng was some remote rural village somewhere and you didn't have access to Wi-Fi and all of those things, in Gauteng, it's very difficult for someone to say, no, I don't have access to this or that in terms of technology. Yeah. So, so But it doesn't seem like we've been using it to no, we're on, we're the things Twitter that you're talking about. Yeah, it's unfortunate because my, my explanations, I would want them to be long so we can get it, but I'll try to compress on. it, no, right? No, okay, You've cool. got, we've got the benefit so, of time so here. So let's look at something. It hasn't been studied. I've studied it personally, mm-hmm. right? But it hasn't been published out there. Let's look at something like Forex, right? In South Africa. What a lot of companies did with Forex is they found influential people. They gave them money. They gave them cars. Go out and post that you made money off trading and go out there and host conferences and get people involved. Margin trading. Let's go. Put in all your money. Let's go. Right. And immediately you found an African youth that believed in Forex and that tried Forex. The amount of Forex accounts that have been opened in this country are more than university students per year. And what we saw, we saw a trend or a, 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 a culture where people started to believe that people are making money through Forex, right? And everybody was sort of saying, Forex is the next thing. We're all involved in Forex, right? Mm. Then we saw a second trend, betting. The same thing happened. They brought in influencers, people that have made money through betting. This guy bought a car, he bought a house. They took photos, they did everything. Whether it was real or not, indulge me, right? Mm -hmm. To say maybe it was a scam. I mean, yeah, let's have those conversations. But indulge me on the fact that there was people who created a propaganda, gave people the internet and showed them the path to success, right? I'm saying, let's create a new propaganda. Let's give people the internet and show them that a blockchain technology uh, 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 engineer can earn 250,000 rand a month. Let's get him to post in front of a Lamborghini. Let's get him to buy a house in Danefern. Let's get him to to have these... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Mm. And on TikTok, the algorithm is showing everybody every day, blockchain, uh, blockchain, blockchain. And everybody in South Africa is like, oh, okay, blockchain is the new Forex, right? Everybody's saying, I want to be an engineer. How are you doing it? Dude, have you seen this guy on, on TikTok? Have you seen this guy? Have you seen this guy? And the government engineers a program that's going to allow people to be indoctrinated with an agenda that the country will actually benefit from, right? Now, it might sound far-fetched, but if Forex and betting could do it, why can't we do that with a skill set that we need to do in our country? I just yeah. worry. I well, think it's. I think you, you illustrate a very interesting example with both betting and Forex. And mm-hmm. I've seen lots of people who've, who look like they've made money, but they haven't created value. Yes. Okay? So you know there's a huge difference. That's the first problem is that you're actually by showing Lamborghinis and fancy lifestyles and all this stuff, you're actually showing people cons- rampant consumerism rather than creating value. So you're going to attract exactly the wrong people. Entrepreneurs are not that interested in just making money, popping bottles and driving sports cars. A real entrepreneur wants to create something. You said problem solve, yeah. which I appreciate about you. You want to find real ways to solve problems. If we're propagandizing and brainwashing in inverted commas, people into seeing success as material wealth. We're not going to have real success. Yeah, but, we're not. But, we're but, going but to attract me- like we're going to attract people who want to see the fruits of this stuff without actually doing the work. Cool. But remember the question I'm answering. The question I'm answering is you saying that if you give South Africans the internet, how do you know that they'll use it properly? Okay. Right? So that's the question I'm answering. I'm not basing it on, I'm basing it on the fact that where every problem exists, you can create a solution, right? Where people can buy into the solution through the creative ways that you've spoken about. Now, I want to bring it closer to home so that you get it, right? Because I think sometimes, a lot of times when we speak about these things, people find that they're very far-fetched and they they struggle to connect. Mm. Let's bring it closer to home, right? If you graduate with a degree in entrepreneurship, we will give you 50,000 Rand to start a business. We will only fund small businesses of people that have studied entrepreneurship, right? Now we've taken away the glamour of Forex, we've taken away the glamour of, of, of betting, but we've made it so practical that to people it's reachable. Now you ask, where did this happen? In Singapore, 
In Singapore, they ensure that they give incentives for certain courses for people to study. And the human brain is like that. The human brain wants to achieve success. They want mm. to know that there's a treasure of gold be, uh, at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. We can do this with HIV. We can do this with teenage pregnancy. We can do this with steering the minds of South Africans to think in certain ways by coming up with a success propaganda very similar to what Dubai did. Mm. Because if you look at Dubai and the under-sitting of Dubai, there's really nothing there. But if you look at the propaganda that Dubai has sold to the world, I mean, why do you have a police car that's a Bugatti? Dubai, explain it. Why the hell is a police car debut? No, <laughs> then people are like, oh, I want to be a policeman because I want to drive a Bugatti when I'm a policeman. Mm. Hey, South Africa, why can't, you, why can't you implement the same thing? And somebody would say, oh, but Dubai is wasting money. There's no crime in Dubai. Mm. There's no crime. People that do policemen in Dubai see it as a, a badge of honor. We have Bugattis in our police force. We have G-wagons. G but we don't, you know. have, we don't have Dubai problems. Oh, but we have Dubai money. The Where? oil that they had. Where oh, we do. We, they won't even let us do fracking in the Karoo or, or, or drill offshore. They won't let us because we've got sustainable environmental policies. Oh, the, you understand this. I think it's stupid because I think we should be, of course, we mm. should be using the resources we have. And yes. you mentioned minerals. What are we going to do about the fact that in mining, you've always had labor issues coming head to head with like just unbelievable exploitation. Yep. And at the same time, the idea that we haven't, there's no beneficiation because we can't do anything with these minerals because we have to send them elsewhere for processing. Mm. We don't have the steel mills that we used to. Mm -hmm. We don't make iron in, and, and, and create uh, yeah, the steel objects industry and, in this and manufacture products out of that stuff. Yeah. We have to send it to China because we've degraded our economy to this degree. Uh, and we don't have the skills to get that back. So, so, so okay. So, so, so maybe then, you know, my, my issue with where a lot of people look at mining is they sort of look at it as though it's impossible for us to do these things in South Africa. And I would rather say it's been made impossible, right? Economies of scale. If I'm China and I'm empowering South Africa to use their minerals, I'm losing jobs. And my constituents in China is not going to vote for me. They're going to lose confidence. I'm going to lose the election, right? My communism might just crumble because people are saying, what the hell is going on with our jobs, right? South Africa, we have been played by many governments that for years have convinced us that we are incapable of using what we have. It's important that whoever gets into power says like Niger, what Niger said to the French, that, hey guys, time's up. Mm. I'm here now. And starts to actually say to those governments, if you're not going to come to the party, we're going to look for other people to work with, right? Very much like how a businessman is being abused would actually go to the market and say, look, I'm going to look for new customers, right? Same thing. We're looking sure. for new customers as a country. Mm. We're saying, China, you just ship everything off. You've never created any jobs. It's been 30 years. We're looking for new customers. Who is available, guys? We'll give you tax incentives. We'll give you this. We'll give you that. Look, part of running a government is incentivizing entrepreneurs to force them by no other means for them to actually open up factories. I've often said to say, look, I've had conversations with people around Elon Musk that have said that if you zero rate taxes in South Africa for Tesla, Tesla would consider coming here. Of course. Here. Mm. Right. And, and uh, we can't even get him to, to bring Sky, Skynet, Skynet in, which would have yeah. helped us because, I mean, because why the government say he has to have a BEE partner. Mm. So he's like, I don't need this shit in my life. I'll just rather <laughs> send it to every Meanwhile other in country. Mozambique, they're having a party. Yeah. Let me ask you this, bro. So um, there's a couple of things that you've, a couple of countries actually that you've mentioned. You mentioned India, Dubai, and all of this other Singapore, stuff. Singapore, Niger. Singapore, Niger. But there is a cultural aspect to all of these countries, right? Say what you will of India, but the people of India have on some level placed education on a premium which is why when they dropped off those devices in there, these kids, their first instinct was to try to come up with new things. Educate themselves. Educate themselves and all of this stuff, right? When you look at the culture of this country, like our lifestyles as a country is a burden on our healthcare system. True. Look at the car accident. In fact, when you think about like long weekends, like the one we just had, mm. you look at the vehicular uh, fatalities, you look at the way South Africans drink, the way we eat, all of these things. <laughs> how how do we fix the culture of this country? We're not saying we hate it. We love this country. No, I love, yeah. I love it too. I love it too. But we've got a problem. No, I love this. We've I, got I, I a problem. Much, yeah. Yeah. 
how do we how do we go about fixing the culture of this country cool so so i've advised the Starlink, president by the way it's not right. skynet skynet yeah. was yeah, like, skynet <laughs> sorry yeah hey, terminator cool so, so, so <laughs> i've had the opportunity to advise the government and when you advise the government you get insight into how companies make money in this country right vodacom and mtn their profits come from pornography in south africa that's where their profits profits come from south africans watch a heck of a lot of porn yeah, mm. rather than educating themselves about See blockchain yeah, technology. Yeah, yeah. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> right. right now as a government they've known that vodacom and mtn have been making profits from from and and by the way these are minors because i mean we all know through geo tech, you can tell how uh, the age of a person right mm -hmm. using the phone these are minors these are young people it's porn everywhere right in dubai they've banned pornography right after banning pornography and i know people fight me where they say but you can't reference productivity to pornography because uh, uh, Dubai is, 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 um, you, you is, uh, could. you could, yeah. You oh, could. okay, great. I'm yeah, great. You guys are you. You no, 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 no. Oh. You can skip this part. We're not. Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, no. I think why right. are we not banning pornography? Why are we not raising the alcohol limit to 21 years old? Mm. Why not asking Shabins and pubs to look for IDs before people enter? You're not like going to find US. a fight with us on these things. No? And we, and we oh, don't, okay. we're, we're not the moralizing type. No, oh, no. Okay. I, I, I'm certainly, I don't see Jack and I climbing in like standing up for pornography or no. standing up for like <laughs> underage oh, drinking. No, there, no? there have yeah. been people that have said you're taking away people's rights. They've, I mean, there are people that have fought me on this. No, no, no. no. So, so I'm saying let's create a new propaganda. And, and I'm for propaganda because you're right. Our culture is very wrong. And our culture stems from what the apartheid system created. Of course, it's been 30 years, but unfortunately, the ANC government has not created a new culture at all. Let's create a new culture. And already, we have instruments in our country that are... I'm I mean, sorry, the, I churches, to the churches in this country are ready to support our ban on pornography today. Yeah, no, the that's cool and all. Also, but we talked about this in the first half. The ch churches are also ready to support all these uh, crooked politicians, and they are. They let them in oh, on yeah, Easter I mean, Sunday oh. to uh, muddy the waters. So I, 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 I like a lot of what you say, Mpo, and you know, we're not here to, to like argue with you. We want to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah. But I think a lot of this stuff, you have very good ideas, and a lot of the stuff you have terrible ideas. And we, we just trying to figure out how much of the good stuff we would want to vote for and how much yeah. of the bad stuff we would definitely want to stay away from. Like, and, and honestly, I, I am an accountability nut, okay? 30 years is long enough for you to establish a new culture. I agree. And the fact is the ANC has. That's not his fault. No, I'm not saying it is, <laughs> it's his fault. I'm just saying, like, when you were responding to my question, I heard you mention uh, apartheid and what, but like, I look, I am not sitting here trying to say that the apartheid does not have a lingering consequence. I'm just saying, as a country, we have failed. As, as a result of our leadership, we have failed to generate a new kind of culture that one. would lead us into the fourth industrial re revolution that everyone keeps talking about. I agree. I agree you, you started him like he's going to rant now. So, yeah, oh, I'm so I'm Paul, <laughs> I, I see in your, so this comes from your book, but you said, for example, you're going to eradicate gender-based violence and discrimination. Now, I think that's a laudable and excellent goal, but it's a lot harder to do than it is to say. Uh, do you have any like practical ideas of how we could get gender-based violence and discrimination under control? Cool, I do. So, so the first thing that we would do is we would report all gender-based violence on a blockchain, right? Because what we realize in this country is that when somebody commits a gender-based violent crime, mm. a lot of times the victim goes back and withdraws the case because they made up or the person sweet talked them or what, you know, a whole array of reasons, right? Mm. So the perpetrators continually get away with it because they sort of train their their um, victims to say, oh, after I've abused you, I'll come back and I'll buy your watch and da, 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 and it'll all go away, right? Mm. If we're recording it on a blockchain, it cannot go away. It will always be there, right? Even when they withdraw, it will say, right, this person had a case like this and they withdraw, right? That's the first instance. The second instance is opening that up to people to check based on you giving them permission to check, right? So you're dating somebody, the person is new, and you say, hey, can we please check your, your gender-based violence history on the blockchain? And this guy is like, no, why do you want to do that? And you're like, oh, sorry, I don't date anybody who I don't have reference to, right? But, mm -hmm. and, oh, and, what, what, this is before a court case has been filed. Yeah, this is before a court case So this is filed. just on allegation. 
look, it will say there that it's allegations. But th- that's horrific because if that's on someone's record... Look, we're in crisis. No, 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 no. So you're saying innocent people will also fall victim to this. No, this is not going to be a public thing where willy-nilly... I'm but saying, who's going to be able to look it up? Employers? No, the person that you gave permission to look. Remember, blockchain, you have to have that permission. So your relationship partner, your lover, mm. somebody who says, look, I want to, to, be, uh, to get but into a relationship... But then you. no one will ever give permission. You don't think people will not you, date people who so, so, I can't check up on? No. I mean, you in this th- day and age, people check up okay, before it. they date sure, someone. Sure, sure. Hold on, Paul. But yeah. in, we're, firstly, let's be clear about what we're talking about. We're talking about gender-based violence. Yes. Mm. This is someone who, for argument's sake, who has been beaten, physically beaten. Yes. Yeah. And then goes back to that person. Do you think that it will stop at, let me see your, uh, your gender-based violence history on the blockchain, that is going to be a hindrance to people. So, so what we've noticed is perpetrators continue to be perpetrators with different people, right? Sure. We're saying, we're saying, how do you protect our uh, women? And of course, I must say men as well, because it happens on both sides. Yes, it does. From the future of this happening, right? The public records that we have of police cases. Do you know, for example, <laughs> if you fell in love with somebody and you want to find out, does this person have a history of, of GBV? It's impossible. Even if you go to the police station, it's, you have to go to that police station and find that police officer that did it. And there's a file room and the file room is a mess. Basically, anybody who gets away with gender-based violence or has committed gender-based violence in this country, y- you can't find it. It's almost impossible to find it. But right? are we saying that We're, someone who has a case opened against them? Because we, we so, do live in a country with a presumption of innocence. Of course. So of course. I could lay a case against you and say that you assaulted me, but... Mm. That does not necessarily mean, mean that you're you convicted. Are... Yes. yes. But remember, the blockchain will say that. The blockchain will say that. So, so what we're saying is we want a trace, a history trace that cannot be changed by anybody. Because we have a situation in our country, and it's very bad, where perpetrators continue on gender-based violence without a trace. So basically, and, and you know, I, I always say to people that when you go to other countries, right? Mm. If I take your ID and I want to find out about your crimes, literally everything comes up, right? In South Africa, if you want to find out, even when you're hiring somebody and you want to find out about their crime, I mean, really, it's a joke. Uber drivers that are rapists have raped 29 people but, only for the but, police to wake up one day and say, sure, Ooh, on, okay. on, on conviction. And that's mm. why we have a, a, law, a legal system. That's why we have a justice department, but not on allegation. No, no, no. So we'll record both. Right. And we're not saying, remember, we're not saying this will be but used. Then people, people will use it for, you imagine how many jilted lovers or angry uh, resigni- resignations from companies, people who've worked for you will say, ah, I'm going to go and make all these allegations about him poor. I mean, people use these things all the time as tools yep. of, of look, war. Look, I, I must say this. It's not based on, it's based on you opening a police case. What I'm saying is when, so I don't think anybody will, will go and purge themselves by going to like, of course, there are people who do mm-hmm. that and they should be dealt with mm-hmm. by the full might of the law. But what I'm saying is we need solutions that will stop perpetrators from doing this. And the solutions we've got at the moment are not working. I mean, in this country, we've got 80 something women that are raped on a daily basis. I know, right? we know that. Yeah. So telling so, us how bad the problem is. I mean, we're completely aware of it. Cool. That so that's one of the solutions, right? The other solution is also looking at a rehabilitative program in our prisons. So our prisons are very much a free-for-all, right? Mm -hmm. The rapist, the thief, this, that, and the other, shove them into one place and hope for the best. After five years, let's hope this person has been rehabilitated and they're able to come out to society and become better, right? Mm -hmm. We're spending so much money on putting people into prison. But the programs that exist in the prisons do not work to rehabilitate them. Studies have been done on simple things. Getting a perpetrator to understand what they've done and the detriments of what is done for them to get dessert. Something as simple as, I'm a prisoner and I'm going to get dessert if I understand the issues that I've committed. They'll just right? lie. Yeah, These yeah. are criminals. But they're, they're, studies, they're, they're, have showed, <laughs> studies have showed that, that, that they, they, they... I want some custard. Yeah, all right, I did it and I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a bad boy. I shouldn't have done I, that. I, I, think there, I think you have a fundamental um, a, a, a misunderstanding of like human nature. Look, I think, I think South Africans have been subjected to a, a misdiagnosis of the human nature. I think that's true. A lot of people think South Africans are inherently bad. No, no. And, and I, people in general, not South Africans, everyone in the world, and especially those people who have ended up in jail. Mm. You, it's a fair assumption to make 
that they are probably not people who have the ability to make good decisions or show the best angels of their nature. Yeah, I, I have a different opinion. Well, then you're welcome to it. Go and sort out the prisons. No one's going to stop you. You could become yeah. Minister of Correctional Services tomorrow. There's a job no one wants. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I mean, even so, what I understand about you is that you blockchain, for example, it doesn't matter how honest or dishonest a person is, but you still can't see into their soul, no matter how good your technology. Mm. True, very true. But but what are the the, the 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 ample things we can do to stop such things from happening? And these are some of the well, solutions. I mean, one of the things that I would like to see happen is that blockchain technology, again, something that you you are well versed in, could be used to do things like. Uh, what Vinnie Lingham's trying to do in, in the US with Civic, he, he's yeah. trying to, to create instant referenda so that you could go on here and we could have active participatory democracy mm. on issues. Like, let's say South Africans were having a big issue around fuel levies and everyone had a South Africa app on their phone, yes. which could verify your, your identity through the blockchain. Mm -hmm. That's a use of technology which we could put into action immediately. Yep. People go in, they use their fingerprint or face ID or whatever, and it, it verifies your once off vote. You can go and vote on the fuel levy. And everyone in the country who doesn't want to vote, fine. Mm -hmm. But if we have a quorum, again, let's say 20 million South Africans vote on this thing, we can change the law like that. Yep. That would be the, fantastic. The, 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 the recent copyright law when it comes yeah. to artists and whatnot. Would we imagine would have, how many it would people have been would get great on for people to right. jump on immediately from the position that they're sitting. I agree. I, I, I definitely agree. So that I mean, like that's where you can teach all these uh, other politicians a thing or two. I mean sure. land, you're gonna be Julius and his crew will eat you for breakfast. Look, I, I think so, so <laughs> I have an opinion on that, and I think it's been quite interesting to, to see that. A lot of times, right, we, we don't understand how the land issue has created many of the problems we sit with today in this country. And I think that the problem is that we don't have enough of the people explaining what landlessness has done to them, right? Let me just remind you that 98% of the people on the face of planet Earth do not own any land. All over. You mentioned other countries just now, so I'm going to do the same thing to you. 98% of the people who live on the planet do not and have not and will not ever own land. Are yeah. you then saying we should take that as a blanket statement? I'm not saying, no, I'm, no, no. I, it is a blanket okay. statement. It is true. Yeah, but, but just the way it's, things keep, that, it's not, it the it's way not it ideal. Is. No, it's not ideal. But I said to you, here's a solution is start giving people title deeds for the, the land they have We're possessed definitely doing that. Yes. for generations. Definitely. Um, who, are your, who are your voters? Who do you think you're going to get? Young, old, rich, poor, this province, that province. Tell me what you're looking for. So we've got a whole array of voters. And I think the first voters understands all the people that are, are looking for employment. That's, that's really our first voters because we, we speak to their current need to say there will be things done practically. We're not just saying government will create jobs. They are steps that are going to be taken to create jobs. The second vote is also the parents. We've realized that a lot of parents are concerned about the future of their children in South Africa. So a lot of the parents are coming on board and also young people. Young people are also saying, look, we get it. We understand. We need somebody who we can challenge and talk to who is not going to come and talk like this to young people, but somebody who will just come and talk their own accent, talk to them in the way they understand, debate them, engage them, and get... Or if you're Musi Mamani, depends which accent yeah, you switch depends. on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because when you're in Stellenbosch, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know? <laughs> You've got to put it on. Never been, so... so yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so, so those, are, those are three voters, yeah. And have you got some funding, or are you funding this all yourself? So I'm funding this all myself. Um, and dude. And, mm. and the are the South Africans that are, that are chipping in. It's expensive yeah. business, huh? It is. Very Politics. expensive, yeah. It Very really is. Yeah. So look, man, we, we, we've we gone back and forth about a bunch of issues. But um, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, you become the president of this country after 29th of May. You've got 100 days ahead of you. Your first 100 days in office at the union buildings. What does that look like for South Africans in a real meaningful way? What does that look like? Look, I think it looks like a lot of shaking up, um, a lot of shaking up. So the first thing we need to do is define an agenda for the nation. So for me, it's vision sharing, mm -hmm. telling the nation, this is the vision we're going for and this is what we're doing. And anybody that stops the vision of the country is an enemy of the country. 
That's the first thing, right? Okay. So where, what, what, whatever that vision looks like, that's the vision that we're all following, right? The second thing is dealing with the crime situation. Um, a lot of stuff in this country don't function because of crime. Mm -hmm. So dealing with removing the police minister, removing a whole lot of red tape in the police system and adding a lot of tech in the police system to sort of check on everything to the point where we have systems that are, that are helping us with that. Empowering young entrepreneurs, making sure that we fund them. We fund people that already have businesses that are working. We sort of say, hey, here's money, promise us to create jobs you know, to people that are already creating jobs, right? And the, the third thing also is lowering tax incentives for international conglomerates. So sitting down with companies and saying, mm. guys, we're going to be unfair. You're a company in South Africa. Yes, we know you've been in South Africa. We don't really care about that. Listen, Toyota, if you can open, we are giving you a special economic zone where your tax is going to be tailored to a certain amount. And we negotiate on that. And the third thing also is bringing a lot of capital into the country, making sure that we, we red tape a lot of, there's a lot of rich people who are uncomfortable about what the government can do with their money, telling them, hey, bring your money to South Africa. We'll protect you. Let's build factories. Let's create employment. Bring that money here and we'll grow that money with you. So ensuring that we take from Dubai, we take from the nations that people find as tax havens. Look, if we can shut down Switzerland, I'd be very happy. So a couple of people here have comments. Uh, some interesting things. Uh, yes, we do buy, do that by ownership. Uh, first getting the lion's share of the profit. And so, I, I'm not sure what Azalea is talking about there. Uh, <laughs> So let's just see here. Uh, this dude is well-meaning, but I wish him all the best, says Carl. He says Carl. you're naive, but well-meaning. Wow, he wishes true. you well. Uh, so Slippery Pickle says Second Amendment's rights would go a long way. Protect the citizens, not the army. We don't have a Second Amendment in this country, yeah, just to be clear. Yep. Slippery Pickle, but I think what you mean is gun rights. Yep. Um, and then Yaku says, refreshing. This guy talks a lot of sense. So there's, uh, there's some fans in the in the crowd here. Yeah, they are. This is good. Uh, Miguel says, let me go and watch porn before this interview ends. <laughs> <laughs> so not everybody. Um, all right. I think we've we've touched on a lot of interesting things here. I thought that Jack's comment there about culture is very, very important because politics mm. comes after that. It doesn't it, come before that, it, right? Uh, it has to. It has to because when I look at things from the top down, right? If you hear that the president is hiding money in his couch that shouldn't be there. When you get pulled over by a Metro Police <laughs> officer, you're going to put money out of your little couch Sheesh. so that you don't get the fine. You get what I mean? It's top down. I was telling a friend of mine the other day that South Africa started off on a trajectory unlike anything else on the planet. Think about it. In 1994, we have our first democratic elections. What happens in 95? We host the world Rugby World Cup. Yeah. Okay? Not only that, we win it. What happens the following, following year? All Africa Games, as well as the African Cup of Nations. We did well in both. Mm -hmm. The following year, what happens? We qualify for the uh, Soccer World Cup for the first time after readmittance. But look at what we've done with our breakfast since then. And we had, uh, let's not forget, mm. under the um, Becky administration, we had 6% growth rates. Uh, mm. I mean, look, look at stuff. what we've done. Do you so, think we can get that all right? Do you think we, can, we have the ability to fix these things? I definitely think so. I think, I think we've got big abilities. Look, I think as, as being an entrepreneur, I've, I've had opportunities to meet. And I remember there was once an investor that came and he was looking at investing in South Africa. And I was part of the delegation that showed him around and, and, you know, assisted. And we were told that this is a billionaire, right? Obviously didn't check into the background and everything, mm. but we assisted, right? And when this billionaire was leaving, we were all at the airport, you know, and he was in high spirits, excited. I'm looking forward to doing this. And he held his pockets at our tumble and he said, where's my phone? Oh no. The moment he said, where's my phone? All of us froze. Oh, all of Jesus. us that were there froze. We are now looking, where's your phone? And then we ask him and he says, somebody bumped into me, but I didn't take any, any liking to it. And oh. all of us as South Africans, we look down and we're like, somebody bumped into him, the phone is gone. Mm. And we're all waiting for what to say, you know? And, and one guy who's next to me says, look, we'll buy you a new phone because we're trying to improvise it. And he says, it's not about the new phone. It's about mm. the fact that that phone had so much information that it's not even backed up and he's now worked up, right? And he ends off by saying, Look, I can't work with a country I can't trust. Mm. He says, if people are going to steal my phone, they're going to steal my business, right? And he leaves. 
There's a lot of people that want to do business in South Africa, want to open up companies, that want to do things, but they just don't trust the country. They don't trust the leadership. They don't trust the way things are done. Mm. And for us, what we're trying to do is to say, if you want the country to grow, you need to create an environment for trust for those investors. And what that means is you need to create a, a, an environment where they feel comfortable to be able to invest. Sort of like a Dubai luring an environment where they feel, oh, my, my guard is off. Bring in all my money. Tell my right. banker to move all my money here. Let's do everything here. I want everything around me. Right? Well, it's interesting that you, I mean, first of all, I love that story because it, it does illustrate a, one of our big stumbling blocks. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not something we sit here and be ashamed of. It's something we must try and fix. Yeah. But I love that you have brought up Dubai a number of times because remember what Dubai was in 1994. It was a mm -hmm. little desert city with nothing going on. It was absolutely the backwater of the backwaters. Sure, they had oil money, but it was all just being used by the people who were at the very top and there was no real development going on. Yeah, mm. it was and Alexandra. Then, right, and mm. then suddenly they decided, okay, this is our trajectory. We're going to run out of oil at some point, so let's turn it into more than that. And they did. And with, with our country, it's almost like the opposite happened. Mm. We'll just keep doing what we always did except the people who benefited from it will be a different group of crooked politicians to the previous group of who did the same thing. Politicians, right? yeah. So yeah. I think it's instructive that you brought up Dubai. And I, I do think that that last story of yours is a very powerful way for us to end it because I think it's an, an excellent thing for, for all of us to think about how, how we contribute to things being better or worse. Definitely. And Paul, I've got to tell you, like, dude, props to you. Yeah. You go out there and you change the world and 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 make a difference and if all your ideas don't work that's cool mm. but at least you're out there making a difference and you have decided to put your money where your mouth is which i have respect for so thank you for coming to see us yeah. and good luck thank i you hope, so much for I, hope you, and, and, I hope you get at least a seat in parliament yeah and shake and things up don't like i i like the fact that you came to sit down with us even though we've kind of been assholes but it's okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you for hanging out man <laughs> he fun. did say he didn't want us to ask him what he had for breakfast yes so we <laughs> yeah it was fun no thank you man no, thanks, thanks so much i've enjoyed this thank Paul you. Dagada is uh his the the guest this morning and his book is called i am the vision it's a manifesto of his political party there it arise is. south africa you can find out more about them by just looking them up all over the socials and on the internet. You can find all the information that we didn't have a chance to get to this morning. Paul Dagada, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. We will see you tomorrow. Cheers.